Hi, it's Mr. Anderson. Welcome to Biology Essentials video number 24. This is on regulation of timing and coordination in development. And so it's really about development and figuring out how we go from that first zygote or that first fertilized egg to an embryo and then eventually to a baby and eventually to you. And the magic of that, we're starting to kind of unlock. In other words, how do we go from this one cell with its DNA to all the various cells inside this baby that do different things even though they have the same exact DNA inside them? And so it's really about uh, new discoveries. It's pretty exciting. And so uh, we start, though, by talking about seeds and how seeds germinate. Um, seeds can remain dormant for a long period of time, but eventually they, they come to life. And so how do we go from those cells inside that, that really small embryophyte inside that that small seed to the seeds of a tree. How do we go from an acorn to a tree? That's what development is, all those specific stages. And so the first step is uh, cellular differentiation. In other words, each of the cells have to figure out what kind of cell they're going to become. They're going to express specific proteins, uh, and those proteins, as a, as a result of which ones they express, determine what cell it's going to be. Cells eventually become embryos, and um, cells inside the embryo are going to induce other cells to become cells like them. And we've been able to show through genetic transplantation and the use of transcription factors uh, how that actually works. Cell death, we're starting to find, is just as important as cell growth. Uh, example I'll talk about is how the fingers and toes form and the importance of microRNA in regulating that. And then finally we're going to talk about the body genes, the homeotic genes, and how they place different body uh, parts where they should go. And the study of mutants has, has unlocked a lot of that. And so let's start with seed germination. And so if you take a sunflower seed um, and plant it, it probably won't grow. And the reason why is it had too much salt on it. Um, but if you take a normal sunflower seed and plant it, it will grow into a sunflower. And what it'll ha uh, in order to do, to do that, you have to give it two things. First thing you have to do is you have to increase the temperature. You have to have a, a perfect kind of a window for the temperature of the seed. But it, you know this if you grow plants. The other thing that you have to do to activate a seed is you have to add uh, water to it. Um, but if you do those two things, if you have the correct temperature and the correct water, um, the seed is going to germinate. And so what we're going to get is a beautiful sunflower eventually. Um, but the cells here in the root are going to be different than the cells here in the leaves and the cells here in the shoot. Um, and so how cells determine that is going to be development. It's the stages by which those cells eventually go uh, and become an organism. And so uh, first thing I want to talk about is cell differentiation. Cell differentiation is how uh, cells become the cell that they're going to be or the cell that they're going to actually act as. And so these are colonies of stem cells, human stem cells, and they can just kind of grow them on this lattice of these fibroblasts of mice. Um, but those cells inside us will eventually specialize. They'll become a cell. For example, these are nerve cells. And once you become that cell, you can never go back to being a stem cell again. In other words, once you've made that choice to become a cell, um, you can't go back. Well, now we can kind of do that in the laboratory, but in life you don't really do that, with a few exceptions for sure. Um, and so how do cells become cells? Well, they have tissue-specific proteins. In other words, if this is a stem cell, and this is really simple, it's, it's just got one chromosome pair, and this is inside its nucleus. But how do we go from that first cell to a, a red blood cell, for example, or a neural cell, or this might be just a run-of-the-mill uh, skin cell, for example? Um, how do we become that? Well, the DNA in each of these cells is identical. And so how could you form all these myriad of cells if the DNA is ex exactly the same? Well, what we've discovered is there are going to be cells in here or genes inside here. Let me label these ones red. And again, this is really simple. And so when a cell decides it's going to be a red blood cell, what we think happens is that all of the parts of the DNA that don't express or, or don't express proteins to make red blood cell all of that DNA is going to wad up or crumple up. And so all of this DNA isn't used, it's wadded up, and the only DNA that can actually make proteins are going to be the genes for a red blood cell. And so even though the DNA in this red blood cell and this neural cell are exactly the same, 
all the neural cell or the neuron uh, genes aren't going to be expressed. I could give a different color for them. There might be like uh, these blue genes that just make um, the neuron, but since they're wadded up, they're not going to be expressed. However, in a neural cell, all the red blood cells would be wadded up, those genes, and then the neural cells are actually going to express. And so when cells make this choice as to what cell they're eventually going to become, we call that cell differentiation. And that happens almost from day one, cells start to figure out what cells are going to be. Um, let's take a look at that and how that might work. And so that one fertilized egg, that one zygote, is going to copy itself through mitosis and make a bunch of cells. And so now we call those stem cells. These cells can become any cell that they want to. And in us, what it'll do is it'll actually form a sphere, a blastula, and then it folds in on itself and causes it, uh, forms something called a gastrula. And the part on the folded inside becomes your digestive parts, and the outside eventually becomes your, your uh, um, the nerves and the in, in the middle part is going to become like the bones and the muscle. And so how do cells determine what cell they're going to be? Well, what we're starting to figure out is there are what are called transcription factors. In other words, cells are going to give off proteins and those proteins are going to determine what type of cell you're going to become. And so I made it really simple. We call these the top and the bottom transcription factors. In other words, this cell right here, just as a result of being on the top of these stem cells, is going to express this this transcription factor. We'll call that the top transcription factor. What's that going to do? Well, it's going to bind with the DNA inside the cell and it's going to cause it to uh, activate the, the specific proteins for a top kind of a cell. It's also going to give off more transcription factors um, to the cells adjacent to it. And so if I animate that here for a second, so what we'll have is we'll have the uh, transcription factor, or excuse me, the, the, uh, the transcription factor right here uh, produced by this cell. It's a yellow cell, we'll say. And that's going to create transcription factors that are going to move to adjacent cells. And those adjacent cells now are going to express more transcription factors. And so they're going to determine uh, what cells they should become. And so these cells know that, hey, we're on the top. These ones are on the bottom. These ones are on the middle. And so there's this cascade of these transcription factors that kind of play out how we go from that first stem cell to the actual embryos. Let me give you an example of one. Um, all of us are born female. But there's one specific gene, it's called the SRY gene, stands for the sex determining region Y gene because it's found on the Y chromosome. And what happens is in males there's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, but this one gene will be given off and it will flood to adjacent cells which will also give off the SRY gene and then you become a boy. And if there is no SRY gene, then you become a girl. And so you could, for example, be XY and you become a boy, but you could also be XXY and you become a boy, or you could be XXXXY, we'll talk more about those later, and you'd still become a boy because you have that SRY gene. Likewise, if you're XX, you don't have the SRY gene, you don't become a uh, a boy. Uh, a, a cool study was done to show the importance of induction. In other words, this idea that these cells can induce the cells adjacent to it or the tissues adjacent to it to become something. Uh, these are going to be these cave fish that are found in Mexico. And there was a study done where they took the lens of, uh, because some of these fish started living in caves and lost the eye. We call these the eyeless cave fish. Um, and what they did is they took uh, similar fish that are found above uh, cave level and they actually have eyes they just pulled the lens out of this fish and they put it in the lens of one of these cave fishes and it, have de it developed a normal eye. They then took the lens of this cave fish put it in the embryo of a normal fish and nothing happened. And so there was something about the cells inside that lens that were actually triggering the formation of all the other parts of an eye. Uh, the the uh, retina, the optic nerve, all of that uh, function correctly through this induction. And so this is called a transplantation and it's one of those studies that showed the importance of where you are, location, location, location. Now not only differentiation but cell death is super important as well. So these, all the parts 
parts of this embryo of a human are going to develop uh, through differentiation and uh, induction. But you'll notice that right here between the fingers and between the toes, the cells are actually dying. And that process called apt apoptosis is actually really, really important. Um, and so not only the growth of cells, but the death of cells is important in forming uh, a new organism. A great example has been studied in the Drosophila. Drosophila, this would be an embryo of Drosophila, and this would be an adult. And um, this will eventually uh, become this. Um, but apoptosis or cell death is super important in that regulation. And so there are a number of different genes that, that scientists identified, and I love the names here. They're the HID, the GRIM, and the Reaper genes. And these three genes in Drosophila cause the cells to die. In other words, they make proteins that cause cells to die. Uh, another important thing that I should talk about is microRNA. MicroRNA is going to be a single strand of RNA. It's found in all organisms, and what it does is it actually disrupts RNA. So it disrupts RNA so it can't actually make proteins. And so what scientists found is that if we disrupted the RNA in Drosophila, in other words, we got rid of the R microRNA, the HID, the GRIM, and the Reaper genes went crazy and they took this embryo and turned it from something that was eventually going to turn into a fly and turned it into something that was nothing that died. In other words, these death genes go crazy unless we have that microRNA actually regulating them. When we put the RNA back in, they are tempering these uh, death genes and then we get development. And so again, development is growth of cells, but it's also death of cells. And the microRNA we're finding is really important in regulating this timing of the development. And the last thing I want to talk about are homeotic genes. Homeotic genes are found in us, they're found in a fruit fly, they're found in a mouse, but we've studied them in fruit flies first. And what we find is that there are a series of genes in the chromosome of a fruit fly that tell the fruit fly where to put the body parts. Now these genes actually lead to a number of other genes. There's a cascade of these genes causing all these other things that build an eye or build an antenna or build a leg. But these ones are super crucial for where it goes. That's what homeotic genes do. And an important set of those are called the Hox genes. That's what I have pictured here. Um, and so where did we learn about homeotic genes? Well, we learned about them from mutants. And so there is a mutation called the ultra by thorax, remember a head, thorax, and abdomen of a, of a fly or an insect, what the ultra by thorax gene does is it actually causes a duplication of this thorax. And so a fruit fly normally looks like this, but if you have a mutation or a change in this UBX gene so it can't function, what you get is not one thorax with two wings, but you actually get two thoraxes. Or if there is a um, a mutation in this ant antennapedia um, gene, what you'll get is one of the legs of the fruit fly will actually grow out of the head of the fruit fly. And so that's kind of science fiction stuff. Um, it's creepy. Um, but what, what it tells us is that inside fruit flies and thereby inside us, there are a series of genes that tell us where the body plan and where the parts go. And so as the embryo starts to develop into a fetus and eventually into you, homeotic genes are, are super important in kind of laying down the, the landscape of where things go. And so that's development. Those are some of the cutting edge discoveries that we've made. Uh, and I hope that's helpful.